going to go through the very basics of apertures. And some of you who've seen my photo, fundament, photo fundamentals course will recognize some of this um, because I have been through this before. But for those of you who are not so much starting out, but are, are, have achieved certain results that they're happy with maybe, but I know that under the surface, there's a lack of confidence in what exact aperture should I use. And I'm gonna to say to you, it's not that important the exact aperture that you use. And, and I'll come back to that point in a sec, because you're probably thinking, what's he on about here? Um, let me just go on to the first slide here. So that that's a lens, obviously, that you can see. In the middle, there's a hole. And, and I know this is really basic stuff, but I want to build up from the basics. That little hole is a variable size. And as you, on this particular case, as you turn the little dial on the outside of the ring, because it's an M-series lens, that hole will get bigger or smaller. On something like an SL or a CL or a camera with electronic lens, you'll have to use a dial on the camera. Doesn't really matter. You can change that, the size of that hole. And the size of that hole affects the amount of light that comes into the camera. It affects the depth of field, which we will talk about in reasonable detail, but I'm going to do an entire webinar on depth of field down the track. So I'm going to introduce the concept tonight, but um, I'm not going to go too deep into it. Just going to show you the differences without explaining exactly how it all works. We'll save that for later. And also the shape of that aperture. And if you look at this picture on the screen now, you'll see that there are obviously eight leaves to the aperture. If I just move my mouse into the viewfinder, you'll see there's eight sections and those are the leaves which overlap each other and that shape affects what's called the bokeh which is the quality of the out of focus areas and i will come back to that i have some slides to show you what that actually means in a little in a little bit okay but number one and number two are the key key concepts here is it affects the amount of light that comes into the camera and it affects how much of the image is in focus and if you think back to the picture that i used to introduce this webinar, the advertising pitch, if you like, there's a red umbrella and there's a car in the background. That's from Havana in Cuba. And I've used a specific depth of field by using, I've achieved a specific depth of field, as in not very much, by using a specific aperture, which in this case was the widest aperture that lens is, was capable of, which was 1.4. And that has separated that umbrella very, very strongly from that background. So the subject is clearly the color that was the point of the picture. It's supported by the background image, which is clearly out of focus. So just a couple of definitions for you. Um, the aperture is physically the size of that iris inside the lens. You can measure it. It's And, and the size of it is the critical thing. Okay, so It physically changes inside. It's not some um, electronic digital thing. It's a physical bit of, it's a mechanism with metal leaves that interlock and give you a size of a hole, which is variable. And that's the key. Shutter speed, I'm sure you understand, is the duration of the exposure. And this ties shutter speeds and apertures into what we call the exposure, which is a somewhat slippery concept, which I'm going to just ask you to put aside for a sec, because we need to lay down some fundamentals before we can discuss how shutter speeds, apertures, ISO and things like that come together to give you a correct exposure. So I don't want to head down that little rabbit hole for a minute, okay? Um, and then the exposure, as I say, is the optimal light capture by the sensor. And I'm using that in a technical way rather than an aesthetic way, because you may want a picture to be dark or light, but it might not be the technically correct exposure. Now, and I'm using that in the sense that a technically correct exposure is when the highlights of the image so that so and, and in my face now, there'll be a highlight somewhere on my head being you know, a little bit lacking of hair, there'll be a highlight somewhere here. And that will be the brightest highlight that should not be beyond the limit of the sensor's ability to record it. So it shouldn't be white. It should be just below that. So that's the limit. Everything else falls into place below that. So we can't specify shadows because we don't know the dynamic range of the camera, but we can specify this end point where the useful, important highlights are not overexposed by being lacking in detail. That's a optimal capture. Okay. Now I know that sounds a little confusing for those of you who may be sort of new to this whole process, but that's the definition of a, of a decent exposure from a technical point of view. It doesn't mean that's the way the picture's going to end up, 
you may choose to paint the picture lighter or darker for you know stylistic reasons um okay that's that so apertures control the volume of light falling on the sensor and i'm going to fall back on a somewhat trite uh, analogy but it works beautifully of the the water the pipe the tap the bucket as you may have heard before so if you have <clears throat> a hose pipe filling a bucket with water the fatter the hose pipe the quicker the water can come out therefore the bucket will fill quicker so if you think of the aperture as being the hose pipe diameter and you think of the time it takes to fill the bucket as the shutter speed and the bucket filling to the brim as being the perfect exposure. If you change the diameter of the pipe, you must therefore change the time it takes for the bucket to fill up. Fat pipe, less time, thin pipe, more time. And that's exactly how an aperture works. So if you use an aperture, which is very small, physically very small, like a little tiny pinhole, it takes longer for the light to come into the camera to give you a correct exposure. Therefore, your exposure duration, shutter speed, must be longer. A wide aperture, big hole, shorter duration, therefore a faster shutter speed. That's that exposure triangle. And I will speak about that in, in more detail about how to achieve that and how to judge it in a future webinar. But that's what the aperture controls. Okay. Just bear with me a little bit of nerdiness for a minute. It's about the numbers on the lens. So I'm assuming I've got a little, little an old Leica here. And I know I'm only very small in the picture, but I've got a, a, an antique Leica here, but they've all got the same control around the lens. If you've got an M series camera, you'll have the control around the lens barrel. But if you're using a, a more modern camera, an electronic camera, you'll have a dial on the camera, which changes the aperture. Now the numbers are a very important sequence and they're not very intuitive. The shutter speeds change in doublings. So it goes from a 15th to a 30th to a 60th to 125th and so on. Roughly doublings. So they are obviously doublings, but these numbers don't do that, do they? They go in functions of 1.4, but not each step of change is another 1.4. It actually doubles when you go two stops. And that the reason for that is that we're not talking about a... Um, a time which is a linear dimension we're talking about an area it's an area so the area of that hole the size of that hole affects the amount of light going through so half the size of the hole means half the amount of light so you have to go through this it's basically the square root of two which is why f1.4 is the first number on this list that you can see now then it goes to two and then 2.8 so that is half the area. So half the area is from 1.4 to 2, half again to 2.8. The difficult thing here is that the smaller the aperture, the bigger the number. And this messes with people's heads. So when I say a small aperture, I'm talking about a small hole, which will be a big number. <laughs> so F16, as you can see in this diagram, is a very, very small hole but I will call that a small aperture, even though the number is big. Now, that's something that you can either take at face value, or there is a little bit of a, a, a mental sidestep you can do here, because as we shall see, the smaller the aperture, the more depth of field that you get, the more is in focus. Now, we'll talk, again, we'll talk about that in more detail in another webinar, but the more is in focus. So large number, Aperture means large depth of field, and I find that more in, more useful. So if you don't want much depth of field, so you want the tip of my nose sharp, but not my ears, that small depth of field, you use a small f-stop number. And if you want everything sharp, from my nose to my ears and to the subject behind me, then you will want a large aperture number. So that relationship between the large number and the small physical hole really is very counterintuitive and I can't really help you more than try and explain it in those terms. Now, please do feel free to ask questions because just like we had with Zoom, I do have um, the chat handy on my right here. There is also the opportunity to ask a question and there should be a button down the bottom uh, which says ask a question, but feel free to use the chat and I will see that pop up in the corner of my eye 
and I will endeavor to answer that for you. So please feel free or by all means, wait until the end and then I will do my best to answer the questions. OK, so that's the the numbering system. And I just I know it's counterintuitive, but just remember, if you want a lot of depth of field, as in a lot of focus depth, you want to use a large aperture number. And if you want a minimal amount of, of focal um, of depth of field, you'll want to use a small number. Okay, And I'll show you what those numbers do in a moment. Let me just get back to that next slide. There we go. So apertures affect, they control the amount of light coming into the camera for exposure, but the result of the choice you make affects how much is in focus from front to back. So there's two things going on here. You're using the aperture to control your exposure by letting less light in or more light in. But as you change that aperture, you are also changing the amount of subject which is in focus. So for instance, this is some pictures I took this morning in my garden, just to make the point. This looks like an iPhone shot and it was taken at F11. And you can clearly see, or I hope you can clearly see that this is a mess. The background is massively distracting. And this is a sort of picture you get with either a very small, cheap point and shoot or a phone. And it's the biggest difference. If you want to separate that one flower from the background, you will need to choose a small aperture number, which is a wide physical aperture. And that reduces the depth of field to the minimum possible for that lens. And you can see now that it goes three dimensional and also the separation is extremely clear. And the reason this is so important is because it draws the attention of the viewer to whatever it is you want them to look at. If you think about the movies, think about a scene where you have two people in a car talking and the camera's looking through the window. So you've got a near face side on and a far face side on. When they're talking, have you noticed how the focus goes from one to the other? This is a, a focus pulling. It's a very difficult thing to do with the movie camera. And we'll maybe talk about that in another, uh, another webinar about video and focusing. But the point is that whatever is sharp in the picture is where your eye is drawn to. So in the example of the movie, the person's talking and they are sharp. Therefore, your focus is absolutely drawn to that person. You can't help yourself. That's the way your eye works. It's always seeking that highest contrast, most in focus part of the picture. So the most common use of wide apertures, large physical apertures to get narrow depth of field is to clearly draw attention to the thing that you as the photographer want the viewer to pay attention to. So there's another one, this is just a rose, same mess of a background, but you do that. And all I've done there is change from F11 to F1.4. And that's taken on the Leica CL with the 35mm Summicron um, Sumilux, Sumilux lens on it, which is beautiful for this sort of effect. Jen is asking me a question here. What's the magic number where lenses are the sharpest? Please say eight, she says, with her fingers crossed. I'm going to talk about that in a sec. So bear with me. I do have some information about exactly how that all works. So Jen, just bear with me for a moment. Um, and Jan says, quite correctly, depth of field is dependent on subject distance. And that's absolutely true. But I'm not going to get into the depth of field discussion right now. I'm going to do that, I think, in August, uh, next but one. So I will be talking about it in much more detail. It is important, but I can only talk about one subject at a time. And we really have five subjects to talk about, which all affect each other. Aperture shutter speeds, ISO, depth of field and exposure. And if we try and talk about them all at the same time, it gets confusing. So I'm trying to separate them out whilst at the same time giving you a hint as to what they affect. So bear with me on that one. So in 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 the field, in, in a creative use, in portraiture, for instance, this is a picture I took up in the Kimberley. Uh, this is one of the traditional owners of this art site. It's called Storm Cave. And that in the background is this big vortex painting on the roof of a cave. We're actually looking up at 45 degrees here. I actually had to get my subject here to actually look down at me and bend so he could, uh, uh, so it looks like it's behind him. But I wanted the subject to be him, his face, his eyes, his very strong face, and use the shape in the background as a supporting element. 
if I'd had them both equally sharp, and this is the key thing here, if two very powerful elements are equally sharp, your eye doesn't know which one to look at and it's confused. You have to decide, in my opinion, with my years of experience, it's important that you decide what the subject is and what the viewer should be looking at. And you have to make a choice. If you photo, if you've focused on the painting in the background, his face being out of focus would be a failed picture because faces almost always have to be sharp because your the physiology and the psychology of your vision is massively attracted to eyes and faces and human figures. That's just the way your brain works. The pattern recognition that goes on in your brain is goes face, eyes, look at that. Okay, so if, if it's not sharp, you will have difficulty pulling off a photograph. If you were gonna have a picture of that painting in the background, sharp, I would have it as a separate picture and I would not have a person in it or maybe even at an equal distance, but you still be confused. So I, those of you, and I know from looking at the list of people who are, are taking part this evening, um, there's a people I've spoken to in person at workshops and those people may remember my, um, my, my sort of uh, enthusiasm for intentionality, meaning that you need to be clear and bold and make things look as though you meant them to be. So very clear in your communication because photography is a communication medium and you're basically telling a story. So you need to be very clear in what you are showing your, your audience and you can use depth of field for that. A question from Gary Gordon, can you use zone focusing for depth of field effect? Um, yes and no, I'm, I think I'm going to defer that one for a future time. It's a little bit hard to answer because it's, a def it's one of those questions where the answer is a definite maybe, and I would need to tease it out a little bit more. So if you'll forgive me, or uh, maybe at the end, I might come back to that because that's drawing in some concepts which I'm trying to put aside for the moment. So forgive me on that one. So um, that's the, a case for a very wide physical aperture, small f-stop number, limited depth of field. A picture like this, this is a cheap station in the depths of West Australia, Muggan Station, not far from the end of the Canning Stock route, I believe. Um, that's the sort of picture where everything needs to be sharp. Now, there's nothing in this picture that's specifically the subject. The subject is the entire building. If you're looking at an image, particularly a big print, but certainly on an iPad or bigger, if you're looking at an image that requires, that has a lot of texture and information in it, you do really, really need to be able to look at the, anywhere in that picture and see sharp because otherwise your eye tries to focus on it and it can't and it's disturbing somehow. So a picture like this would be very hard to pull off with very limited depth of field. Uh, if you could imagine the, the, the distance uh, part of the picture, say in here, was sharp, but this here and this window here and this beam here were really unfocused. The picture would be difficult to look at. So some subjects lend themselves to lots of depth of field and some subjects lend themselves to minimal depth of field. And experience will tell you after a while which is most appropriate, but in broad terms, portraits, details, small things, things that have got a lot of separation from the background, which is usually small things or, or portraits, uh, they can benefit from limited depth of field. Larger subjects, particularly views, interiors, architecture, um, things like that, often benefit greatly from lots of depth of field. And you notice I'm not really talking numbers here. I know it says F11 on this picture. That's because I thought somebody would ask me which aperture I actually use. But it doesn't matter whether it was 9.5 or 11.5 or 8 or whatever. It's just a lot of depth of field or not much depth of field. And it's a bit lens dependent too, which I'll come back to in a sec. So I'm hoping that makes sense at this point. So please, as I say, do fire off some questions if you want to tease something out. Um, coming up, a, the this is this idea of bokeh. This is the quality of the out of focus areas. This isn't how much it's out of focus because that's very much dependent on the aperture itself. 
but it's about the way that the lens throws things out of focus and it's really subtle and there is this word called bokeh which is uh was adopted in the 90s by mike johnson who used to be the editor of oh one of the photography magazines i might have been rangefinder i'm not sure which one it was and he was looking for a word that that, that doesn't describe how much something's out of focus but describing the qualities of those out of focus areas and it's a japanese word that's very very loosely translated he says choosing his words carefully to be blurry but i believe it's a little bit colloquial it can actually mean slightly drunk as well as in feeling a bit blurry but anyway that's another discussion but the 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 term bokeh has been used for this quality of image and here is a shot uh, taken on a workshop at Cockatoo Island in Sydney and um, you can see how those highlights in the background the door these are windows they've made these interesting shapes which are quite interesting and very smooth and very um, very pronounced that would be high quality bokeh and this lens that I use which is the uh, the Noctilux uh, 0.95 aperture is designed for that use you get very little depth of field like only one of her eyes will be sharp but it throws the background out beautifully prime lenses generally speaking are superior for high quality out of focus areas compared to zooms and this is a shot from cuba again taken on the standard 24 to 90 on the sl Zoom lenses generally do not have particularly good bokeh. And if you look carefully, if you look up here, can you see how this area is kind of confused and a little harsh? It's not smooth and creamy. It's got this sort of staccato look to it. I hope you can see what I'm talking about because it was actually quite difficult to find a picture that illustrated the point because Leica lenses in general are quite good at this sort of thing. But zooms are lenses that are functional at the expense of a particular look to them the prime lenses are less less convenient shall we say because it's obviously one focal length but they do have the ability to produce these beautiful out of focus backgrounds if you choose to use them in that way so you've got a choice there of form and function the the, the 24 to 90 is a, an amazing lens i use it for an astonishingly high proportion of my pictures but if I want to use an out of focus background effect, I will generally go to a prime lens. So again, it's a choice. So I would not be particular. I'm not bothered by the fact that this is not particularly beautiful out of focus because it's really about the car, isn't it? But just to make the point that that would be considered to be fairly harsh bokeh, whereas the previous picture, this would be considered to be far more interesting and smooth and more attractive. Um, oh, right. So that's the qualities of our out of focus areas. So just a little recap. Um, exposure is controlled by the size of the aperture, which affects the amount of lens light coming into the lens so that we can darken or lighten the picture. OK, that much is clear. But from a that, that's a technical exercise. OK, the, ex getting the right exposure is fundamentally a technical exercise the creative side of exposure can come later in post or you may choose to do it in camera that's up to you but fundamentally it's a it's a technical exercise in correct exposure not to overexpose which is uh, a very difficult um, thing to recover underexpose you can get away with but ideally you want to get the right exposure but from a creative point of view your choice of aperture affects the picture at i would argue more than any other setting depending on what you're doing if you're photographing moving objects the shutter speed is obviously very very important and that's the subject for the next webinar but for, for broadly static subjects that we've i've been showing you so far the aperture will be your most creative choice and it's not something you can change later now i know some phones have this thing where it'll do this multi-field um depth of focus effect and you can change it later but it is actually a fudge it's a masking effect and it's not a genuine depth of field effect when you choose an aperture you're committing to it 
Okay, so it's this is why I wanted to have this discussion so you could you could understand the choices that you need to make, and and it, this is your creative choice. That's why I almost always start by choosing my aperture. That's my starting point. Now I don't always do that, but most of the time I'll be thinking in terms of what aperture do I need for this subject? Do I want plenty of depth of field or do I want a little bit? And it's really as simple as that. It's, it's almost a binary choice, lots or not much. Okay. So choosing the aperture, how do we do that? Well, it depends on the subject. So again, be clear in your, in your intention. And I, 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 I really stress this idea that the actual aperture you use is less important than the effect you get. So whether it's 1.4 or 1.8 or 1.7, don't really care. Okay, or 5.6, 6.7, 8, don't really care. I want not much depth of field or plenty of depth of field. And I will generally avoid the really extreme apertures at the small aperture end of the scale. So the, the F16, F22 and so on. And I'll tell you why in a sec, which takes you back to a question from before from Jen who was asking about lens quality which I will come back to in a sec so be clear in your intention and when I say that I mean make sure that your viewer knows what to look at if they should be looking at everything then everything needs to be sharp if they're looking at one specific thing then that should be sharp and it can be separated for clarity by throwing the background out of focus so portraiture close-ups studio shots to a certain extent okay so the widest aperture that your lens has will be the one that gives you the most separation okay whether it's 4 2.8 1.4 whatever okay so whatever the widest aperture that you've got access to and lenses vary dramatically for instance the uh the cl i have the 35 mil similux which is an f 1.4 maximum aperture Whereas the uh, 24 to 90 zoom on my SL2 is an f2.8 to 4. It varies depending on whether you're wide angle or telephoto. So at the 90 millimeter end of the range, it's an f4 lens. So that's the best I can do. f4 will give me the least depth of field that that lens is capable of. I cannot open up the aperture wider than that. So this is important that you understand what your, your gear is capable of. This particular lens, um, this particular shot, and the one after it was taken on the Leica Q. And that is uh, taken at f1.7, uh, even though it's a wide angle lens. And again, I'm not gonna get into the wide angle lenses depth of field discussion yet. I wanna, I wanna do that in more detail, do it justice in, 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 a, in a few weeks. But even so, this uh, taken at 1.7 really holds your attention on the gentleman in the middle taking a picture of me with the Noctilux. Same with this shot. This is actually me. This is a picture taken by my wife. Uh, I was very fortunate to have been, um, I was going to say given, but lent, <laughs> loaned the use of a pre-production uh, 75mm Noctilux, which is the 75 f1.25. Um, they wanted uh, pictures, as his head office in Germany, they wanted pictures that show what the lens could do. So about uh, six months, nine months before it was released, um, a couple of prototypes were sent out to a couple of people around the world. And I was lucky enough to be one of them. And this is actually at the ECA in Brisbane. And I was taking pictures at f1.25 to show what the lens could do. But the picture that my wife took of me using the camera was taken on the Leica Q again at f1.7. And you can see how that background is recognizable, but I'm clearly the subject. And if she'd taken it on a phone or at f11 or something, that background would have really clashed with me. So it would have really spoiled the picture. So f1.7 was the obvious aperture to use in this case. How are we doing for questions? All good. So this is the sort of effect you can get. This is that 75mm Noctilux. Um, I went to the Echo in Brisbane. I also went to some rodeos and did some rodeo pictures with that lens, which is a bit tricky because it's only manual focus. But this was the caller at one of the rodeos I went to. So here's the guy on the microphone telling, you know, telling everybody what's going on. And when I saw him, I thought, I've got to do a portrait of this guy. And you should be able to see that his eyes are sharp, but virtually nothing else. And the background just drifts off into this lovely, creamy, out of focus effect. The reason it works is because those areas are not 
areas that are important except as supporting the subject, if you follow me. Okay, they're not something that you want to scrutinise closely. You get the sense of a fence. You get the sense of a bit of blue sky. There's a building in the background. It's not really recognisable. They are not important. What's important is the guy's face. So by removing your attention from those areas, I've made the picture a lot more um, a lot more impactful, I would, I would say, simply by using f1.25. I could have done this at 1.4. I could have done it f2, depending on the lens. At 4 or 5.6, it'd start to get a little messy. So I would always urge people when they're thinking of buying maybe their second lens is to consider a prime lens in the mid-range focal lengths, 50 millimeter, 35 millimeter, something with a really wide aperture for this sort of shot. Because when you're starting off, a lot of the lenses that you're buying at the lower end of the price spectrum are F4 designs, maybe 5.6. And I get people saying, I can't get that effect that you get with this camera. And that's just a hardware thing because you simply cannot open that aperture up wide enough. They are, it's kind of a specialist thing. You don't need a Noctilux for quite a lot of money. But certainly um, an f1.4 or an f2 lens is a very, very useful thing to have in your bag of tricks. Okay, detail. Now, this is the other side of the coin. This is when you want everything sharp so that if you did a nice big print or somebody was uh, examining this image in great detail, they would see that everything is sharp. So this, I don't know exactly what the shot was taken at, but it would be somewhere in the f8, f16 range. Um, I think it's probably about f11. I don't usually go beyond f11, uh, and I'll explain why in a sec. But this is a sort of picture where I want everything sharp. Okay, this is a very, very long exposure. For those of you with um, who've noticed, the water has gone a little bit weird, and so the clouds are a bit mm, silky too. This is probably 30 seconds using a very strong ND filter. And that's something I'll be discussing when we talk about shutter speeds in a future webinar. Um, picture like this, again, it really needs close scrutiny. You want everything in this shot to be crystal clear and sharp. So it's a shot I would have taken at 11, 8, whatever, um, depending on the light conditions and so on, but definitely looking for depth of field. There's nothing here to separate out. Okay, I, everything needs to be sharp. If I had something in the close foreground, Maybe I would consider throwing the background out of focus, depending on what it was. But this particular shot is showing scale. It's showing the lushness and the richness of the rainforest. This is up uh, Springbrook National Park uh, on the border of New South Wales and Queensland, in just inland from the Gold Coast. And you want to show the, the, the lushness, the richness and the scale of this rainforest. And But to do that, you really want everything to be sharp. So my choice here would be F8, F11, something like that. Um, again, this is this is a uh, South Georgia island near Antarctica. Uh, I want those oil tanks or whatever they are, big tanks, to be sharp as well as the church in the distance. So this would have been shot at probably f16 because I wanted as much depth of field as possible to make sure everything was sharp. Is again, this sort of picture really requires uh, or invites close scrutiny. If the church was sharp but the tanks weren't, or vice versa. When you come to look at the other strong element, you'll be disappointed because it's not you can't focus on it. So this sort of shot really needs that depth of field. Um, and when we talk about depth of field, I will also touch on the subject of focus stacking because you can shoot a picture like this in two different exposures and focus on two different things and then join them together in Photoshop. Um, just as a little teaser, if you like, for later. But in this particular case, um, I didn't have the time and I didn't need to because it worked out, it worked fine. There's another case where you will be wanting to not use wide apertures and that's close-ups. So this is a beach. I'm not sure where I took this. Um, it escapes me, but anyway, um, I think it's Tasmania. Yes, this is this is down near, um, on, near Freycinet, on the beach near Freycinet. Picture like this, let's say you've found a really interesting arrangement of shells and you're, you're sort of, you're, you're pointing your camera down at the ground. The chances of you getting your camera perfectly at 90 degrees to the ground are fairly remote. So the chances are that the ground will be at an angle and you'll end up with soft corners because the depth of field that you've achieved isn't sufficient to take into account that tilt, if you, if you like, camera looking down and the ground might be like this. 
by stopping down to f8 or f11 you can incorporate the thickness of those objects and the corners of the shot and it makes a much much more satisfying image when all the corners are nice and sharp as well as the center now that's not the lens being soft in the corners that's because the shape of this might even be slightly domed it's hard to tell or you might be slightly skewed in your angle so a shot like this really benefits from using a, a smaller aperture, as in a larger f-stop number, to get a bit of depth of field, even though it's a close-up, and even though nothing is being separated, just for sheer quality, that will give you a, a much stronger image. Um, question, where was the black and white shot of the church taken? That's at um, uh, South Georgia Island. Um, I can't remember the name of the town. It's the main town on South Georgia. Uh, Grootviken? Something like that. But yeah, it's, it's there. Great, great spot. If you ever get a chance, do go. Okay. Sometimes choosing the aperture is of a lot less importance than you might imagine. So here's a couple of pictures that kind of defy possibly some of your preconceptions about apertures. This is Brisbane, um, taken from near the, uh, the, the Maritime Museum in South Bank. I've shown this picture to quite a few people and very, very few people actually picked that it was taken at f1.4 on a 50 millimeter lens. This is taken with the 35 mil Sumilex on the CL. And if I could zoom in on that picture now, you would see that the, the name on the sign is perfectly sharp and the buildings in the distance are perfectly sharp. And somebody in the, in the comments earlier made the point that depth of field is dependent on the distance to the subject. And that is so true. So when you've got a subject which is all a long way away your depth of field is always going to be enough to cover the subject whether it's 2 8 16. so that comes with experience judging that if you ever try one of those little depth of field calculators you can get for your phone just try the numbers when you've got a subject distance of let's say 200 meters and you'll find that there's a lot more depth of field than you think you've got and in fact some people are disappointed when they can't separate out subjects from backgrounds and it's because they're too far away. That separating out from a background effect only really works well with something fairly close. And I mean within, say, six to ten feet. A little bit depends on the lens you're using, obviously. If you're using a big telephoto lens, that changes the equation dramatically. But again, I'll, I'll come back to that in, a, in, a, in another webinar. But taken at 1.4 and you would never guess it. Picture like this, this was taken at uh, f5.6. Again, you would never know it. And the, the only reason I used f5.6 for this was because I wanted a very specific shutter speed. So I not I actually chose a shutter speed first because I wanted a car to blur a bit. Not too much, not too little. This is taken at a 50th of a second. And having taken a few test pictures of traffic coming past, I determined that that was about the right shutter speed. Therefore, I used 5.6 to get the right exposure. So this is a shot that's not that's not influenced by the aperture because uh, something big like those silos in the background, they're going to be sharp anyway at 5.6. It doesn't really matter. My priority was the shutter speed. And when you're doing street photography or documentary photography, you just got to get the shot. I, I would have given very little thought to what aperture I used on this. And when I've got a situation where the aperture is really not important, I very much, I very frequently hedge my bets and go with 5.6. It's nicely between the extremes. It's got a little bit of depth of field for a subject like this, but it also is a wide enough aperture so that my shutter speed's not too low. So if you're in a situation where you've no idea what you're up against, and you're doing sort of documentary work or things, not really fast street stuff, that's a little bit different, but stuff like this where you can actually take a moment to take the picture, but you're not setting it up. 5.6 is not a bad place to be. Like in, you know, it, it, if in doubt, 5.6 would be a good starting point. And then if you get the opportunity, you may choose to shoot another picture and do something differently. Okay, but this was taken at 5.6 on an 18 millimeter lens, in fact. Uh, on my SL2. So again, the, the, don't get obsessed by the exact aperture that you use. Just be aware of the consequences of that aperture that you have chosen. And you may have chosen it for different reasons, but as long as you've got deep down in your muscle memory, in your head, if you like, 
the idea of what the differences are. Okay. Um, now, there is another factor that um, we were uh, talking about briefly. It's Grootviken, sorry. That's uh, Jan says Grootviken. I was, wasn't far off of Falkland Islands war fame because they were invaded by the Argentinians and they were all captured there as well. I think there were half a dozen um, soldiers stationed there. They all got captured. So great place if you get a chance. Um, coming back to the question from before, choosing the aperture with respect to image quality. And this is uh, raises a very interesting question. For, let's call them consumer grade lenses. I'm talking about the sorts of kit lenses that might come with a very modestly priced um, digital SLR or a modestly priced point and shoot camera. Um, so I won't say cheap, nasty, but mid, mid range or below. So if you had a bought a DSLR and a lens, it may be under a thousand dollars, something like that. The lenses that that will fit into that price point are designed to a price point and they come with compromises. One of those compromises is that the optical design isn't maximized for the widest aperture. So you will see something like this if you graft image quality against the aperture. So this is from 1.4 through to 22. And you can see how the middle apertures four, 5.68 are the maximum image quality. Okay. F1.4 is not too bad. Now, th this is heavily simplified. I've got to stress, this is very simplified, but it, it does make the point that if you have a cheap zoom lens, excuse me, if you have a cheap zoom lens and you shoot it at its widest aperture, you may very well be disappointed in the crispness of the image. If you take the same picture at 5.6 or 8, you'll be very impressed with the quality, but you'll have more depth of field than you want. And if you were doing a portrait, you would have great difficulty getting a sharp image with a nice out of focus background because the hardware won't let you. This is what you pay for with the higher quality gear. So again, th this is actually a slightly different graph, again, based around aperture, but it's showing edge, center and averaged. So you, mostly we'll go around the center. So you can see clearly the center sharpness climbs right up. Now, the exact aperture that is the sharpest as a general rule of thumb is not necessarily 5.6 or 8. It's usually two or three stops closed down from the widest aperture. So f1.4, one, two, three. Those two there are the sharpest ones. So if you had an f4 lens, you may find that f11 is the sharpest, but it may be f8. You need to test it. So if you're in doubt as the quality of your widest aperture, you need to test it. Photograph a piece of newspaper at 90 degrees, something with really fine detail, and do your own tests. So these are consumer grade lenses. Okay, so if you or and old lenses too, you'll find this happening. If we look at Leica lenses, we do see something slightly different. This is by design. Now, this is a, this is not to knock any other brands. I won't tell you which manufacturer this comes from, but it's a good one. This is a very a, a wide aperture 85 millimeter lens from a very respected manufacturer. And this is not based on aperture across here. This is two graphs, one at 1.4 and one at f5.6. This is what's called an MTF chart. And this is measuring contrast of lines at different um, sizes. So this top one is something like five lines per millimeter, 10 lines per millimeter and 30 lines per millimeter. So it's a measure of resolution. And across the graph is the distance from the center. So this is the center of the lens. This is five millimeters either side of the lens. So a circle five millimeters wide and right to the corners of the lens. And you can you see here that f1.4, the, the, it's about 80% contrast here. 60% and somewhere below 40% contrast. But when you change the aperture to 5.6, look how much it improves to 90% contrast, which is really good, 80% and 60%. So it's very clear how changing from 1.4 to 5.6 increases the quality of this lens. And this is not a cheap lens. This is still a very respectable lens. Leica lenses are designed very specifically by Peter Carver to be at their best at the widest aperture. 
And this is the equivalent chart of the 90 mil Summicron SL lens, which is my favorite portrait lens. And you can see here how there's almost no difference between two and 5.6. And in fact, if you look closely, you'll see that it's actually better here at f2 than here at 5.6. Now this goes against the common wisdom that lenses are higher quality stop down, but that's because it's not a budget lens <laughs> and it's designed by one of the best people in the business, Peter Carver. This is what you're paying for. This is the ability of a lens to be used at max with maximum contrast at its widest aperture. So that sort of proves the point and it's absolutely visible. So um, Peter Carver always says, you should always use the lens at its widest aperture. Now, I don't fully agree with him. On, there, there, there are cases where you do want depth of field, but he's really, really forceful on that. And there are not many lenses on the market that you can absolutely rely on to be at their best at the widest aperture. Okay, that there are other lenses out there, certainly, um, but they will be very quite, well, really quite expensive too. But all the Leica lenses are designed with this in mind. So just wanted to make that point. All right, well, that's um, 40 minutes. That was about what I aimed to, to talk about, uh, the time I wanted to talk about, 40, 45 minutes. Um, that's the end point of my formal presentation. If anybody would like me to answer any questions about anything we've spoken about this evening, please feel free to drop that into the chat here and I will do my best to actually answer them. And it'll be a few seconds before I see what you type in.